Hi everyone, it's Dirk here from HA Photography. I'm really glad to be here with you today. Uh, I am a full-time working photographer here in Enamel, BC and very excited to be working with the Vancouver Island Regional Library to produce these online photography tutorials. Okay, so what are we going to be uh, discussing today? We're going to be discussing exposure and the three different ways uh, or the three different devices on our camera that will affect our exposure. Uh, not only will they affect, uh, affect the exposure that you're creating, but we'll also have uh, some interesting effects in regards to stopping motion, capturing motion, depth of field, your aperture, and uh, using your ISO. So we'll be covering those three topics today. Today. So, what are the things that affect our exposure in our camera? Well, we have the ISO, I'll get into more information on that in a sec. Uh, we have shutter speed and we also have our aperture. So, let's start off with ISO. ISO stands for International Standards Organization. I don't know why they call that. I think it's a silly name myself, but that's what they decided to call it. Um, back in the film days, uh, I'm dating myself now, uh, back in the film days we called it ASA. Don't ask me what it stood for because that was a long time ago. But um, what it did uh, with film, you had more sensitive film that was better to use in low light situations. ISO does the same thing, but for our digital sensors. So a higher ISO, say a thousand or two thousand, and they can go up much higher, uh, is great to use for low light situations. Conversely, lower ISO is used for bright light situations or bright days. Uh, you don't need to have the high ISO and uh, there are some drawbacks from using a high ISO which we'll get into in a bit but for bright sunny days uh, and brightly lit situations you want a lower ISO. The other tools that we have uh, are the aperture. Uh, you can see here um, that the, this is a larger aperture, it's allowing more light into your sensor and a smaller aperture uh, brings less light to the sensor. It also serves as another function in regards to depth of field which we'll get to in just a moment. And then there is uh, your shutter speed. It, your shutter uh, is a curtain that lies in front of your sensor and uh, it will be open or closed for the time that you allow it. Uh, obviously the longer it is open, uh, the more time uh, the sensor has to read light and the shorter time obviously it's less, less uh, light is hitting the sensor. So all these three, your ISO, your aperture and your shutter speed all help determine a proper exposure but they all have some uh, unique attributes that help make for your creative images. Okay, so we briefly touched on ISO, International Standards Organization, and how we use that to, uh, to get the right exposure. And when are some instances that you would want to use a higher ISO? Well, in this first image we have here, uh, we have Neil who is rocking it out. And uh, oftentimes in concerts, there's not a lot of light and they're moving uh, a fair bit. So I needed to make sure that I stopped the movement. Uh, and so I used a higher ISO to make make my sensor more sensitive to light so I could use a higher shutter speed to capture Neil doing his thing. In this next image, we have my friend Camille in beautiful natural light and uh, although she was already holding still, I still used a higher ISO uh, as I think I was hand holding this. Um, here's actually just a quick tip. When you're using um, longer shutter speeds or high ISO, having a tripod can be a real benefit to that. This next image, uh, we have a starry night and uh, um, this too required a higher ISO. So anytime you're outdoors or indoors where there's a lot less light, uh, there's not a lot of action necessarily to capture in this, but uh, the ISO helped capture this image. And finally, uh, we have Nadja, who uh, again is performing and she was moving and as you can see, very little light on her, um, but we caught her right in the, back, in the midst of a sway and we needed a fast shutter speed to capture that uh, as well, it was in low light. So a great time to use uh, a higher ISO. So you might ask yourself, well, why don't I shoot in high ISO all the time? 
The reason being is that like um, high speed film back in the day, the higher speed film you had, the more grain and the more fuzzy and the less sharp your image was. And the same applies to higher ISO, um, but in today's terms we call it noise. So the higher ISO you have, say up in the rounds of 2000 and higher or so, you'll start to see um, your images not be as sharp and as clear as they are shot with the lower ISO. So be mindful of that when you're shooting. Um, you want to generally use a higher ISO just for the dark lit situations or um, when there's limited light. Please go and try and explore using different ISO settings and see uh, how that affects your images. And don't forget, as you adjust one of these principles, your ISO, you may need to adjust your shutter speed and or your aperture. Okay, this next uh, component talks about shutter speed. It is that curtain in front of your sensor that opens and closes uh, for the amount of time to make sure you have correct uh, exposure. But it also can do other things. It can show motion or it can stop motion. When would you want to show motion? Well, in this image that I have right here at Paradise Island, we see the worker who's uh, captured frozen still, but the machine was moving fast enough to show motion. I think it makes the, the image more interesting, adds some depth to it, and shows that it's a busy place. This next image I have uh, showing motion is uh, my friend Jan, uh, who is a curler, and uh, I like the busyness of the movement. It showed that it was action. I think it makes the image far more compelling. Another example when we may want to show motion, uh, we have here at Quick Copy, we have the gentleman who's got uh, that sort of forklift uh, capturing him in motion while we still have someone holding still. I think it just adds something to an image to so sh show some motion um, and it makes it a bit more interesting. This next image we have is at the Nanaimo cruise ship terminal. We see the, the helicopter in motion as well as people moving. I think it just again makes that image more dynamic. Uh, it gives our eyes somewhere to go to when we're scanning the image. And this last image, uh, more of a nature image or land, um, nature image, we have uh, the trees in the foreground uh, holding still and the water in the background uh, showing motion. I love this image. I think it's just, uh, it's very calming and water when uh, for slow exposures makes a beautiful, I don't dreamy type effect. So maybe uh, you can take your camera and uh, do some long exposures to capture that motion. Uh, remember, a tripod is really handy to have for that because uh, sometimes these exposures get quite long and uh, we can't hold it still for that, that long. So grab a tripod, grab your creativity, and go explore long exposures. So we talked about how a slower shutter speed uh, will make your images show movement. The opposite uh, when using a fast shutter speed. And when would you want to use a fast shutter speed? Well, we see it lots in sports photography. And here's my example of some ultimate Frisbee players. You can see the one gentleman there, I'm assuming he's a gentleman, is uh, leaping out and, uh, and trying to capture um, the, the Frisbee. So we see it used a lot in sports. Here's another example in my studio where I had uh, this lovely family doing a Christmas card and they were throwing flour at each other and uh, the fast shutter speed allowed us to capture uh, the flower in mid-air. Um, so another great use for a fast shutter speed. Here's another fun uh, shot that I did catching a water drop and uh, uh, we needed a fast shutter speed to stop the motion of that water drop falling. So, using a fast shutter speed will stop motion and can make for compelling, interesting images and in showing the intensity of sport, the fun a family can have throwing flour at each other, and neat artistic shots of catching water drops, and many more examples. Take your camera, have a fast shutter speed, and see what interesting images you can capture. Okay, we're on to aperture. So remember the aperture is that device inside your lens that closes and opens. I hope you can kind of see that. And what's really kind of odd is that um, the bigger the lens opening, uh, the smaller the number. And the smaller the lens opening or the aperture opening, the bigger the number. It seems kind of counterintuitive. If I was doing it, I would have 
done it differently. But anyways, that's the way they do it. Um, so it controls the amount of light that's hitting your sensor, but a uh, smaller aperture, a larger number, will put more things in focus in your uh, viewfinder. And uh, why do we want to do that? Why would we want to have more things in focus? Well, you can see in this image I have here of this gentleman with his uh, fancy red car, it was important to have his car in focus, him in focus, and his home, and the dramatic sky. So I chose to use a, uh, a small aperture setting or a large number on my lens to capture that. And uh, that worked out really well. Here's another example of the BC Boys Choir and to me I found the, uh, the background was so lovely and we wanted to make sure we had everyone in focus uh, so I decided again to use a, a smaller aperture uh, to make sure everything was in focus. This next example, we have uh, this lovely uh, scene on the waterfront here. You can see that the wood grain on the pathway is in focus as well as the islands and the clouds in the background. To me, uh, the, um, having more things in focus or a bigger depth of field was really good to make this image stand out. So. Those are examples of how we might want to use an image which has lots of depth of field. Remembering that you need to have a small aperture opening or a larger number to do that. Now remember of course as you adjust one of the exposure tools, say in this case aperture, you may need to look at adjusting your shutter speed or your ISO. Okay, so we talked about using a uh, large depth of field, having lots of things in focus. The reverse of that is having a very shallow depth of field. So we're going to open up the lens as much as we can. And this obviously lets more light into the sensor, but it also has the effect of having very little in focus, um, or the area of focus is very shallow uh, in your frame. In this picture I have here of Don fishing, uh, it is just his face and, uh, and his outfit that's in focus, and you can see everything else in the background is clearly out of focus. And why do we do this? Because I want the attention to be on Don. And, uh, and not necessarily the background. This next example of uh, the shoes uh, is a lovely wedding day and I thought the detail on the shoes and the pearls were a really nice feature so I made sure to focus on those, have a very shallow depth of field so everything else was out of the background because to me it wasn't as important as the details of the pearls and the detail on the shoe. And here's another example using portraiture, you know, photographing people to highlight the little boy here. And uh, his mom, although is, uh, is, is uh, we see her there, but is not in focus. I think it just really highlights the young boy. And uh, so using a shallow depth of field is great for when you really want to highlight something. And um, so take your camera and uh, use a shallow depth of field, a large opening in your camera to explore. Let me show you some comparisons in just a sec here about how using uh, a shallow depth of field and a large depth of field in more or less the same sort of setting. Okay, so here um, I've got some sample photos of uh, an interior photo shoot I did where we have the living room scene and we also have a scene uh, was just to the right of that uh, from the kitchen uh, looking into the room and in one you can see everything's in focus. Uh, you can see the fireplace, the room in the back is in focus and the foreground is in focus. And in the other image we have um, at the seating at the bar here we have just the first bowl is really in focus with a bit of the tap. The background is out of focus um, and so here we are in the same sort of situation where we used lots of depth of field to help tell that story and in the next image we have a shallow depth of field that tells a slightly different story and really it just comes down to your artistic approach and how you want to how you want to use it. This next example uh, my trip uh, to Alberta. Lovely uh, new wheat grass field here. We've got the sky in focus and the wheat uh, up front is all in focus showing the vast green space and the beautiful Alberta skyline. And uh, 
once again showing off the wheat but in a different perspective we just have the single wheat uh, in focus and everything else is out of focus and a nice sort of blurry and it really draws our attention uh, to the the wheat um, so just showing you some examples of difference between using a shallow depth of field so when the lens is really open and a um, large depth of field when the lens is uh, the aperture is closed down so I encourage you to uh, go out, grab your camera, explore shallow depth of field and uh, uh, big depth of field and uh, to help tell your creative story. Okay, so this has been fun. We talked about uh, shutter speed and how you can control your images and control motion using shutter speed. We talked about aperture and using shallow depth of field and uh, large depth of field to tell a different story. And we also talked about ISO and how we may want to use that in lower light situations. We also talked briefly about how important they all are in composing uh, and creating a proper exposure for your images. Um, this has been a lot of fun today. Um, please take lots of pictures and uh, we look forward to connecting with you again soon. Take care. It's Dirk from HA Photography. So long for now.